Hi everyone, my name is Laura Mistretta. I'm a resident organizer with the CV OEO Mobile Home Program. Uh, we serve mobile home parks across the state and work with homeowners to make sure they know their rights, um, file complaints if necessary, connect people to resources, and just overall really promote you know, the fact that mobile home parks are a critical source of affordable housing here in Vermont. They, you know, over um, 3,000 households live in mobile home parks and it's one of the most affordable homeowner options available today. Um, for folks who might not know much about mobile home parks, the way it works generally is that people own their own homes and, and rent the land. Uh, so they are paying a monthly lot rent payment that goes to funding the infrastructure and operations of the community. However, we've seen in Vermont that there is definitely a lot of deferred maintenance in our mobile home parks, water systems, sewer systems, roads, electrical, and the cost of these improvements often falls on the backs of the homeowners who live in these communities. Due to, you know, the way federal and state programs are set up, mobile home parks are often excluded from affordable housing dollars, which are more geared towards renters. Um, and while, of course, we want to keep the money flowing to, to, to create affordable rental units, we also think it's really important that the state and the federal government can look at mobile home parks as affordable housing and invest in them like they are affordable housing because every dollar that gets invested by the state is another dollar that won't need to come out of the paychecks of people living in these communities who might be living off of many of whom are living off of social security or other types of fixed incomes and so rent increases can really make a huge impact um, so yeah the hope that you know gives you a taste for why mobile home parks are so important here in Vermont and why we should be investing more in them with our public dollars. My name is Madeline Roberts and I am the tenant advocate at Vermont Tenants uh, CBOEO. And um, it is a program I, that serves the entire state. Not all of our programs do at CBOEO, but this one does. We do a lot of education um, in the hopes of preventing, you know, issues or educating uh, tenants so that they know what to expect and what their rights are, what their responsibilities are, that sort of thing. Since COVID began, I've been getting an increased amount of calls from tenants whose landlords have all of a sudden decided to sell. And so they're really concerned, where are we gonna go? Um, houses are being snapped up in a hurry and many rentals are no longer rentals. You know, people are buying them sight unseen, they wanna move up here um, and they no longer want to rent. Um, I've had calls from people who have signed leases whose landlords have decided that they no longer wanna honor that lease. Um, and so there are a lot of concerns about that. The lack of affordability, the loss of income. Um, I've had a, quite a number of calls from uh, tenants who are not able to access um, any financial assistance, either they're a little bit over income or they've just, they're not computer savvy. So they've had trouble with that kind of thing. You know, I think people are just really kind of stuck. We need livable wages. We need rents that um, aren't, you know, going up so dramatically. I've had calls from tenants whose rents, they have been told, if you stay here, the rent is now going to be $400 more a month. That's crazy. That needs to stop, you know. Um, home ownership opportunities, 
you know, help with down payments. And I think um, there are some programs around that are doing a great job with that, but more of that would be, would be good. I, I've talked to a lot of tenants who were almost in a position where they could buy. It certainly would be more affordable, um, but they're not quite there um, or they don't have the resources needed for a down payment. Um, just cause terminations. There's a lot of no cause because people just, you know, the landlords know that tenants cannot fight that. I would really like to put a plug in for our website and that's um, www.vttenants.org. There is a lot of really great information there. Um, my email address is there. So for folks who want to reach out, you have questions, um, you want to look at the tenant book, you want to sign up for some classes. Um, there's just a lot of really great information there. with the CBOEO Fair Housing Project. The Fair Housing Project does uh, housing discrimination education and we support people um, in pursuing, you know, how to move forward with reporting discrimination. But we also think about uh, housing access in a more broader sense. So we think about what, and we do advocacy for what needs to happen for more inclusive communities. Vermont has had an issue with affordable housing access for quite some time now. During the pandemic, specifically, we've had um, you know, an increase of out-of-state buyers pay more for houses than they were on the market for. And it's put our renters in really like intense uh, situations and accessing housing that also means that landlords are more um, able to be selective in who they choose to rent to, which leads to more housing discrimination. So folks that have vouchers are having extremely hard issues accessing housing, especially folks uh, receiving our CARES vouchers, which um, is supposed to specifically help people affected by the pandemic access housing. We're finding that people um, receiving CARES vouchers are having no housing choice at all. This, this coming uh, fall, we start producing housing at a rate that Vermont has never seen before. We have a really big um, influx of funds for affordable housing through um, federal funding around the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's just a critical moment to start advocating for the needs of the lowest income Vermonters. We should have a say in how that housing is created and uh, make sure it's actually meeting the needs of the people, not furthering uh, housing inequity that the federal government has been complicit in. Uh, we all know the history of redlining. There's a lot more that can be said around that. This creation of housing that happened, starts happening this fall, will continue for a couple years because of this funding influx is going to impact the housing landscape and the overall community landscape of Vermont for decades to come, decades. So we have to ensure that those, that the housing created is meeting the needs of people and making housing most accessible for uh, the folks that have been traditionally not representing in the housing market. And specifically from the fair housing perspective, I'm thinking of the protected classes that the Fair Housing Act was made to uh, ensure that housing choice was available. Right now, if you're in the protected classes, if you're a person with a disability, if you're a person with color, if you're a new American, uh, if you have children uh, and are low income, you are not being served and you do not have housing choice here in Vermont. So we have to make sure that our new housing created 
actually enables housing choice for the years to come. I'm Rewa Worthington, and I'm the Director of Asset Management for Evernorth. We're an affordable housing developer and owner and tax credit syndicator in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Years ago, we identified internet access as a need for our residents, and we began to try to identify ways to provide it through our housing at no cost to them. At one property where we successfully installed free to our tenants campus-wide Wi-Fi, a resident reported to me that she'd been previously homeless and lived on a very limited income. So she was beyond grateful to be able to cancel her internet subscription and use that money for other resources, like food. The median income of our residents is around $17,000 annually, so it's painfully obvious to our organization that they often lack the money to pay for this basic service. We found that on average, people in our housing pay between $70 and $80 a month for what's now not a luxury, but a utility. A lot of our residents have told us that it's a significant burden to pay for Wi-Fi. One resident said, I have to cut as many corners as I can to make sure Wi-Fi is paid every month. And another resident spoke about her child saying, we've lived here for seven years and we've never had TV or internet because we have our data on our phone and that's normally enough. But when you have to do school for the whole week all on one line, I'm like, I don't know what to do. That's $80 a month for him to do school. But it's not only a residence and it's not only a financial issue. 20% of Vermonters lack access to reliable high-speed internet. That's 60,000 households. Vermont is the fifth worst state for coverage, speed, and price. Now, this is certainly caused in part by the rural nature of our state. In fact, Governor Scott recently proposed an infrastructure plan that allocates 225 million for statewide broadband improvement. Strategically targeting that infrastructure at multifamily developments will reach more people in a shorter time, but we know more needs to be done. The recent pandemic has highlighted the importance of this connectivity for employment, education, medical care, mental health, and much more. So now more than ever, we need to look at how to provide fast, reliable, affordable internet to as many people as we can. I used to say that Wi-Fi was a utility that should be available to everyone, just like heat and electricity. But someone recently corrected me and said it was more than that, because so much of our daily lives is tied to it. I know this pandemic has been really hard on all of us, but I'm encouraged that it has brought the conversation of connectivity to the forefront, and I'm hopeful that our partners and funders see how intrinsically tied to the success of our residents it is so that we can continue to do more.